Hello, this is a video tutorial demonstration of the CCD Lab UVIT pipeline for reducing level 1 archive data into science images. Now we will have CCD Lab open and we go to the UVIT menu and the first thing we will do is select extract L1 zip archives. When you install CCD Lab, all of the options should be set for you so that it will automatically proceed all the way through up to orbit-wise registration, which we will have to perform manually. For example, these check boxes should all be set, and under digestion, they should all be set as such as well. So we select this menu item, double-click it, and we navigate to the folder and the archive we want. Usually there are several gigabytes in size. This one is 2.2 gigabytes, and we simply select open, and it will proceed. Now 7-zip should be installed on your system, and CCD Lab will call up 7-zip to begin the extraction of the raw data. So at this point, CCD Lab has extracted the raw data out of the archive using 7-zip, and now it is pulling out the centroid lists from the data. It pulls out both the FUV and NUV centroids from all the data, and as well, it has to extract the int mode visible tracking data from the data which has been pulled out. So basically, we are forming images here individually. It gives you a report that you can watch. There's 652 files, for example, was pulled out of that orbit. 964 visible image tracking data are pulled out of that file. So this can all proceed automatically. It is now determining the background to use for the vis image data. And it is now applying the background correction to all this image data. You can see up here, it is giving a report of 7,404 files of this tracking data, which are being corrected for this background, which you see displayed. Now CCD Lab is proceeding with drift tracking and it's running through this automatically. If you set the switches, you can slow this down and provide confirmation each time, but typically you can run this automatically. It does flash up the drift series plot and you can see that it is automatically determining several points to use in the drift series. Uh, the different colors on the tracks that you see here don't represent anything. They're simply there to help your eye distinguish. Uh, the different tracks, and it's just done for visualization purposes. Typically nothing goes wrong, but sometimes something will go wrong, and you will see the tracks fly off the screen. In that case, you will need some manual intervention. So typically you would come to me for that. So now it is applying all of those drift series just determined to first the FUV data, It's loading those images for display. Now it is going back and processing the NUV data if it's available. So now all of the images that have been reduced and corrected for drift will be loaded here. So we have 18 images in total. We can blink through quickly if you like by setting the blink time to zero. I can go slowly. I can do it manually with your back and forward button on your mouse or with these buttons. In any case, you may observe that in addition to the translational shifts from orbit to orbit, each image here is from an individual orbit observation. So in addition to the translational shift from orbit to orbit, you can also see that there is some rotation. So in order to merge this data into a single master image, we must register these images. 
So this has to be done manually. This process cannot be easily automated uh, because each field is just so different and so unique. So we see that we have a good source down here in this area. And we also have a good source up here in this area. We can just start with one source just to make it easy. So we go to the UVIT menu, registration, general registration. Typically we can leave this set at four, which means one fourth pixel resolution. We double click general registration. We navigate to the directory. We will register all the FUV and NUV data together. So in the FUV directory, we have FUV calcium fluoride filter data. In NUV, we have NUV silica data. So if we want to register all of this together at once, we simply select the parent directory. By selecting the parent directory, it will find all of the relevant files required in these two subdirectories. We could, if we liked, uh, process only one directory at a time. So in that case, we would select the parent directory for calcium fluoride, and you can register all of these. If you select only this directory, then you're telling it to register only a single image, which obviously doesn't make sense, and so it will tell you uh, to try again. So we want to register all orbits of FUV and NUV all at once. Sometimes you can do this, sometimes you want to do it one at a time. Typically you can do it together, although sometimes there's such a differential in the image quality between FUV and NUV, you really can only do one channel at a time. In this case, I'm just going to de demonstrate doing all orbit data for FUV and NUV together. So we select the parent directory. Please select the point sources with left click, which stay within the field of view for the duration of the image set. Right click when done. So we press OK. Now it comes up with the first image. We set our box size here, and we can simply collect, click on this nice bright source up here. Now we right click to continue to the next image. Continue to image 2 of 18. Yes. Now, if we make our window size, which you can see down here, this box, if we make it large enough by expanding, then when we click to the next image, this point will automatically determine the brightest source within this window radius, and it will automatically move. In a case where the source moves too large of a radius or the window size is too small, then when we click, for example, let's find where this happens right now. Even though I have set the window size to be small, it's still tracking. Here's a good example now. So now it was not able to find the source. It just went to whatever was brightest within this area, but it didn't find the source we wanted. So we notice that when we move the finger pointer over top of the point, the registration point, it lights up, which means we can then left click it and pull it. And as we pull it, it will search for a bright point within the vicinity of the radius of the sub-image window box. And once we're close to it, we can let it go and it will snap to it. So that's just some sort of some assist there for you. So we can continue. We're on image 15 of 18, so we're almost done. So it asked to determine the registration formula and apply it. And so I had clicked there, yes, very quickly. So now it is going to determine the registration. In this case, it's only, it is only translational registration because we're only selecting a single point. So it is simply going to register this single point that's among all images. So if we blink through fast, and we can see that that point is registered. It's falling on top of itself for all Im images. But you will notice down here that there is some rotation which occurred, a rotational differential in the, in the pointing orientation between some orbits. And so there is some small rotation remaining. So we need to correct that. And so here is a good source which exists in all of our images. We can see that this source here is in all of our images as we blink through. So let's stop. And now let's register if you need for any reason to remember which source you wanted to use, you can simply mark the coordinate that way.
And in fact, I can demonstrate that. So let's mark that coordinate since that is our reference coordinate. And let's mark uh, this one. You can see that within the radius of the window box down here on the right hand side, the source is staying within the radius. So I go mark coordinate. So let's stop. Now go back to image registration, general, general registration. Double click that. Again, select the parent directory. Please select the sources. OK. Now, because we have pre-selected two sources here, instead of going to the trouble of having to click on them again, we remember that our window size down here needed to be a certain radius so that as there's some rotational shift in the source down here, it stays within this box radius, box size radius, so that the algorithm can, can find the, the relevant source. So we could just click these, but we can also, because we've marked these points, you don't have to do that. You don't have to have these points marked. But if you had marked them, then you can just now right click right away and it will ask you, should I use the marked coordinates for registration? You can say yes. Again, if you didn't mark the coordinates because you simply remembered where they were, that's fine. And you won't have these marked coordinates. And then you would simply click them, left click, and then right click, and then it will ask you to continue. Now at this point, because CCD Lab knows that one round of registration has been performed and that you're probably just performing second order registration, that the points may always fall <clears throat> within the window box radius. And so it may be able to automatically run through the registration itself. We won't do that right now because I will demonstrate for you how to make sure that these points are aligned. So let's click no, and I will demonstrate this procedure later. So we'll click no, continue to image two of 18, yes. And so we just right click, right click again, keep going through because it's only some of these images that are rotated. So now this was our anchor point because this was the first one selected. So we just click on it, make sure that it's still on the point. Then we go down to this one and we rotate it. See, we can actually rotate this point around a radius and so once it's within the window box our region of interest box we can let go and it'll snap to it and so we continue I clicked too fast there and this is why it asks you are you sure you want to continue so let's select no and I will rotate this manually in place there it is Let's rotate this one in place. Again, if it's actually within the box size of your region of interest subwindow, you don't actually have to move it because it will determine the correct coordinate itself. It will determine the maximum source within the region of interest. So determine and apply the registration transformations. Yes, yeah, so now there is going to be a rotational transformation applied in order to align these images. And the rotation is, of course, applied to the centroids themselves. And so there's no loss in image resolution due to a rotation being applied, which is what you would normally get with a normal uh, pixel-wise image. If you rotate it, you do lose some resolution in a, in a rotation process. So now if we blink through, you can see that this point is now aligned. Now, just to demonstrate to you how that would work, we could go back to registration, image reg registration, double click that, press on, we want this parent directory, yes. So select point sources with left click, okay. But we're going to use these sources which have been pre-selected with the marked coordinates. So we can simply right click, should I use the marked coordinates for registration? We click yes, we can see that the registration boxes have now appeared. Now it's asking if it can run through the registration coordinates for all images automatically, assuming that the points stay within the region of interest radius, re region of interest radius here. And so we click yes. And so it will simply now do it automatically. So you can do it one way or the other, depending on the state of your images and the degree of differential, basically rotational and translational. So in this case, it will simply reproduce the same images as we already have because it will have determined that there is no more translation 
and no more rotation between all the images because we have already done that manually previously. So we blink through again. Excellent. So now that the images are registered, we want to merge all orbits together. So we go to the UVIC menu, to the registration menu again, and select Merge Centroid Lists. So we double click that. Again, we select the parent directory and it will determine the all of the files which need to be merged in these two subdirectories. So there's one of two because there was calcium fluoride in FUV and there was silica in FUV. So in the end, we're going to end up with two master images. So you can see that the signal to noise has now improved markedly. We have much brighter sources and much less obvious background from doing that merge. Now, another step that we might like to do at this point is to optimize our source profiles. If you look down here in this window, you can see that there's perhaps some remaining drift. And typically, you will find that in some severe cases, you find marked drift remaining in the FUV channel because there is a slick stick or a, uh, a slick stick, slip stick, sorry, uh, thermal differential that manifests in the, in the telescope pointing between the FUV telescope and the VIS tracking telescope. And so sometimes you'll see quite an extended source here. And so that needs to be corrected out. So typically what we would do is we simply blink through quickly and we already have two sources which have been selected. We wanna look for the brightest sources which occur in the same images. You could do this one image at a time, but obviously it's easier to do it if you can do it to so both images at once that are loaded. So let's continue marking coordinates. That's a nice bright one. This is a nice bright one. Um, this appears to be a fairly decent one that's in both images. Here's one. So typically you just need to select a few. You don't need many. You do need more than one for it to for this next process to be automated. So we want to match the contrast here so we can see the radius of the PSF here for this bright source. So we want to zoom down until we're just capturing the whole radius of the source, of the PSF, of this brightest source. So we can turn that off. Now we're going to optimize the source profiles. If we look, for example, right now at the fit, we get about 1.5 arc seconds in calcium fluoride for FUV, which is fairly large. And if we check the NUV, that's 1.2 arc seconds. So we can actually optimize the source profiles automatically. So we go to back to create drift correction list here from PC mode list. So that means from photon counting mode list, which is what we're viewing is photon counting mode images, which have been reduced. And we go down here to optimize point source region of interest. So with multiple sources selected, we can now simply double click this and the CCD lab will automatically determine the optimal source profile by applying second and third order uh, residual, basically shifts, drifts to the, uh, to the images. If you select only one point, you have to manually select which stack time you would like to use. Typically a value of 20 or 25 is going to be fine. Uh, and when you have multiple sources selected, then it performs it automatically. So let's double click this. And now it's telling us file one of two, image one of two, optimizing source profiles. So we let that run, it should only take a moment. Now it's doing image two of two, optimizing source profiles. You just have to wait a moment. And now it is finished and it will load the two images which have been optimized. Now this is FUV calcium fluoride once again. 
and we can check the fit and now we can see that the source profile is much tighter there's much less scattered compared to before and now we're down to 1.2 arc seconds 1.2 8 arc seconds and if we check NUV again the scatter has been almost totally eliminated and we're down to one arc second sometimes we can get results down to 0.8 arc seconds so at this point the image cannot be optimized any further and we have essentially a final science image. However, we need to determine the world coordinate solution. So for that, we're going to use the WCS menu. The WCS solution will be applied to the image which is displayed. Typically, it is best to use the image which is closest to vis wavelengths. So if you have FUV silica, that's not bad. Typically, you will find more difficulty with FUV calcium fluoride. If you're working with older data, which still has NUV, that definitely works the best because the catalog we are querying is the Gaia DR2 catalog, which is a visible catalog. And so the closer we are to visible wavelengths, the faster the solution will be determined. So first we want to query the catalog for this region. Everything should be set here with the correct settings, your radius the right ascension and declination of the pointing of the, of the telescope, which is in the header of your image. So we double click Astro Query. It's asking us where to save it. So let's save it in the parent directory. So now we'll call Python. If it cannot find Python on your system, perhaps you don't have it installed, or perhaps you will have to navigate to where Python is for CCD Lab to then be able to use Python the Python executable. So it is querying Gaia and it is finished and now it will solve and it has solved almost instantaneously in 0 0.06 seconds. It's solved with these points that you see scattered across the screen. Now if we click yes it will automatically refine the solution and so we have 313 sources spread across the field which have been used for the WCS solution. This cross you see here indicates the right ascension declination orientation of the image with blue indicating cool, which means it's pointing north declination. So we can see that our image is rotated almost 180 degrees and north declination is pointing south. So we would like to correct that to make this image collinear on its pixel axes with the sky coordinates. So we go back to UVIT, registration again, and we simply select derotate loaded images via WCS. So we have the two images that we've been processing and finalizing here. And so we click this once. So current image as a reference, yes, of course, because that is the one which we have solved. The other image doesn't have the solution. This is the one that does have the solution. Current image okay to use to base the rotation upon, yes. So we click yes and we proceed. It applies a derotation. Again, this occurs at the centroids, on the centroid lists, on the centroid scale. It's not being applied to the image itself, and so there's no loss in resolution from this rotation transformation. So now we can see that north is pointing straight up, and right ascension is entirely horizontal. And if we click to the next image, now the next image also has the same solution because these images have been made collinear. If we remove the display, we have to press a link here, and we can see that these stars are all totally aligned between the two images. So you can see that we have a real nice re registration there, and the WCS solution we have solved using the one image is applicable to all the other images. In this case, only the one other image. Sometimes there's more images if there are more filters had have been observed in other observations. So at this point, we are finished, and we can simply finalize this result. So we go to UVIT, Finalize Science Products, click that, and it will automatically pull up this folder. It will move the final science image and its exposure array into the parent directory. It will compress that into the parent directory's name .zip, and then we are asked would you like to delete all intermediate UVIT reduction folders? Typically we can. We don't need the intermediate folders. 
anymore once we're done creating the final science images. So we simply hit OK. Those intermediate folders will disappear. It will leave this folder, which is your archive folder, which is the original 2.2 gigabyte zip archive. Typically, we don't want to delete that because if we ever need to reprocess the data, we don't want to have to re-download it again from AstroBrow. So that's why that file and that folder is left. If we look in prasanta.zip, which is the parent directory for this image, for this target, you can see here the images. So here you have your FUV calcium fluoride master normalized exposure array. So that's your exposure array. And here is your master normalized exposure image. So that means it's your science image with normalization to the exposure array. So that it has a uniform observation time across the whole field. And then similarly for your, if you, or, uh, your NUV images. So that is the process and you now have final science images. Um, your final exposure time is this value in the header, reduced time. It is also found under exposure time because exposure time is so common to use, exp underscore time. It's also copied here. So it's the same thing, but that is your final science observation time. And with that, you have your final images. So I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions or any problematic data, which is not tracking very well or other strange behavior is occurring, perhaps you may even find a bug still in CCD Lab, please do contact me and let me know. Thank you. Bye-bye.